Welcome everyone to the latest on line five, key pathways to protect the Great Lakes from an oil spill disaster. I'm Liz Kirkwood, executive director of the nonprofit for Love of Water, and I'll be your moderator today. I'd like to begin our engagement by sharing a water and land acknowledgement. Flow is located on lands historically occupied by the Anishinaabek Odawa, Ojibwe, and Badawatami nations. Please take a moment to acknowledge and honor the ancestral lands of the Three Fires Confederacy, the sacred lands and waters of all indigenous peoples and their continued presence. I am delighted to be co-hosting this webinar with our partners at Bay Mills Indian Community and the Oil and Water Don't Mix campaign. This is the eighth summer that Flo has hosted an educational conversation for Mackinac Island, the Straits area and beyond. While we miss seeing you in person, we are delighted to be able to reach you through this free webinar supported with a grant from the Mackinac Island Community Foundation's Natural Resources and Preservation Fund. The community of Mackinac Island writ large has been a leader on line five. And I wanna thank you all for your courage, conviction, and persistence in this multi-year battle to protect the Great Lakes and a way of life here for the benefit of all Michiganders and visitors. Today, we'll feature three co-panelists who will share legal briefings and campaign updates on the future of the 69-year-old pipelines in the Straits of Mackinac and Enbridge's proposed tunnel to replace them. Then we'll turn to our Q&A format to respond to your questions that you can submit anytime during the webinar using the Q&A button. We'll also be taking questions via Flo's Facebook live feed. So let's begin with uh, line five and provide some context. First and foremost, this is a story about water, a battle to protect 20% of the world's fresh surface water. And because Enbridge continues to defy the state's lawful shutdown order, Line 5 remains a clear and present danger, a ticking time bomb in the Great Lakes. Every hour, this pipeline pumps almost a million gallons of oil and putting our most precious life-giving resource at risk. Past its 50-year life expectancy and propped up to extend its failing design, Line 5 remains exposed to exceptionally strong currents, lake bed scouring, new anchor and cable strikes, and corrosion. This pipeline occupies public trust waters and bottomlands held in trust by the state of Michigan for the benefit of current and future generations. This means that the state has a perpetual duty to protect the public's paramount rights in these waters over public interests like Enbridge. The Straits of Mackinac are also the treaty lands that five tribal nations reserved in the 1836 Treaty of Washington to hunt, fish, and gather. The Straits of Mackinac is a major shipping lane in the Great Lakes. Over the decades, ship anchors and other objects have repeatedly dented and gouged Line 5 and exposed the pipeline's bare metal. Meanwhile, the fierce currents have scoured and eroded the lake bed floor, forcing Enbridge to re-engineer Line 5 with over 228 saddle structures that elevate the pipeline off the lake bed floor. Enbridge wants this to be a simple story about jobs while denying the catastrophic risk. To do this, Enbridge has drawn on its vast and unparalleled financial resources and has spent years obscuring facts and promoting false narratives about our energy dependence and the impossibility of pursuing smart energy alternatives that do not threaten our drinking water, fisheries, economy, and way of life. Enbridge has ratcheted up the stakes by invoking undue political influence with the Canadian government and other US state governments. 12 years ago this week on July 25th, 2010, next slide please, Enbridge's Line 6B oil spill burst west of Marshall, Michigan. The National Transportation Safety Board report described this disaster as a complete breakdown of safety quote, made possible by pervasive organizational failures at Enbridge, unquote. Here's some numbers you may remember. 17 hours to respond to the Line 6B rupture, a million gallons of heavy tar sands along 40 miles of the Kalamazoo River, and a $1.2 billion cleanup. 
These numbers, however, do not do justice to the families who lost everything and to the wildlife forever gone. To date, Enbridge's Kalamazoo disaster is one of the largest inland oil spills in US history. Outside the Straits, Enbridge's Line 5, next slide, has failed at least 33 times since 1968, spilling more than 1.1 million gallons of oil in Michigan and Wisconsin. Next slide. An oil spill in the Straits could pollute vast reaches of open water and the 720 miles of shoreline along Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, according to the University of Michigan. Michigan Technolo Technological University scientists have characterized the Deepwater Horizon and Exxon Valdez disasters as, quote, useful analogies for the ecological impacts, unquote, of a Line 5 rupture in the Straits. Finally, a host of unacceptable risk besets the continued operation of Line 5 in the Straits and the proposed tunnel. A Line 5 rupture could strike a catastrophic $6 billion economic blow to the economy, communities, and natural resources, and billions of dollars more in the impact to the region's commercial shipping and steel production. Engineering and geological experts warn that the proposed tunnel would contaminate surface and groundwater sources, and its operation would pose a catastrophic explosion risk. The climate pollution released each year from Line 5 would be equivalent to nearly seven new coal fire power plants. And finally, there are, uh, there's available capacity and flexibility to meet energy demand in the Great Lakes region or already exists in the North American energy pipeline system operated by Enbridge and its competitors that don't threat our public water economy and economy to many, according to multiple experts. One of Ambridge's own experts has concluded gasoline prices will rise about half a penny in Michigan if the Line 5 oil pipeline shuts down. The historical record supports this conclusion. Line 5 has already been shut down with no impact on gasoline prices in the US or Canada. Next slide. Despite Enbridge's best legal, political, and media efforts, people in the Great Lakes continue to unite around water. It's in our DNA. We instinctively know that they are part of our common heritage to enjoy and protect and to pass on to our children and grandchildren. What will we do to make sure these waters are protected for our children and our children's children? Water defines everything in our past, present, and future. The global water crisis, is part of the global climate crisis. With rivers of water in the sky, replenishing and healing every arc of the water cycle is critical to addressing climate change impacts of massive flooding, droughts, severe and unpredicted storms and weather events. So with this back, backdrop, it is now my honor and privilege to introduce our distinguished panelists. I'm delighted to be joined by Whitney Gravel, President, Bay Mills Indian Community. Welcome, Whitney. Zach Welker, Flo's Legal Director. Welcome, Zach. Sean McBrarity, Campaign Coordinator, Oil and Water Don't Mix and Legislative and Policy Director at Michigan Clean Water Action. Welcome, Sean. Thank you for joining us today. And now I would like to introduce Whitney Gravel who's a citizen of the Bay Mills Indian community, uh, Ganuja Kaning, place of the pike in the Upper Peninsula in Michigan. After graduating from Michigan State University College of Law in 2016 with a Juris Doctorate and a certificate from the Indigenous Law Program, Whitney worked for the Department of Justice with the Environmental and Natural Resource Division in the Indian Resource Section where she worked on cases related to the scope of tribal lands and jurisdiction, treaty rights, and the protection of lands held in trust for tribes and individual Indian lands. Whitney also served as chief judge of Bay Mills Tribal Court and again as in-house counsel and attorney for Bay Mills Indian Community. Currently, Whitney serves as president of the executive council on behalf of the Bay Mills Indian Community and sits as commissioner on the Michigan Women's Commission and the Michigan Advisory Council on Environmental Justice. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Ani Bojo, Giwede Nagabo, Kwe Indishnikas, Ganushnikani Nindonjaba, 
My name is the woman who stands in the north. My English name is Whitney Purbell, and I'm very honored to be here today and join all of you. Um, before we get started really in my presentation, I think it's important to note that tribal nations have a very distinct legal and political status in their relationship with the United States government. They are independent sovereign nations and treated as such under the United States Constitution. A lot of what the legal ramifications uh, involved with tribes, you know, not only in the line five uh, disputes, but also in our relationships with either the state or the federal government come from that unique distinct political status. And that is often derived and seen and embodied in treaties. The big treaty that you will hear about reference to line five is the 1836 Treaty of Washington. This treaty was negotiated uh, with the successor tribes now known as Bay Mills Indian Community, the Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians, the Little Travers Bay Band of Odawa Indians, the Grand Travers Bay Band of Odawa and Chippewa Indians, and the Little River Band of Odawa Indians. Those successor bands, their ancestors, negotiated the 1836 Treaty of Washington, which allowed for the territory then uh, known as Michigan to achieve statehood. You'll see here on the slide, there is a black outline surrounding that 1836 treaty ceded territory. In those treaty negotiations, 14 million acres of land and 13 million acres of water were exchanged for enumerated treaty rights, which is the treaty right to fish, hunt, and gather. It's really important that when we talk about treaty rights, we put it into the context of what was happening at the time that treaty negotiations were taking place. That is also a canon of construction under federal Indian law. And what it requires then is for us to look at what were our ancestors, the ones who were negotiating that treaty, attempting to preserve, protect, and allow for the continued existence of our indigenous lifeways. And our ancestors understood that when they were signing that treaty, that preserving those treaty rights, that treaty right to fish, hunt, and gather, they were also preserving the ability for our people for those next seven generations to be able to continue to survive. They understood that the right to fish, hunt, and gather was intricately, intricately woven into how we exist and coexist with the natural resources around us. Next slide, please. There is a very long and documented historical fishing that takes place by the Anishinaabe here in the Great Lakes. We have used traditional gear such as gill net, trap nets uh, throughout the waters of the Great Lakes long before there was any other type of contact that took place uh, either in the Great Lakes or in the state of Michigan, typically from the French fur trade. This can be embodied, you know, in the fishing villages that were established, the small gardens, how we interwove those treaty rights, whether it be fishing or hunting or gathering into how we were maintaining our indigenous lifeways. It's extremely important to share with everyone and help folks understand that the treaty rights are not just about the physical act of going out and fishing or hunting and gathering, but that they were interwoven into our life ways. Uh, many times our elders will say, you have the treaty right to play with fish, laugh with fish, dance with fish. And what they actually mean is that by completing the act of fishing, you are completing our, our indigenous cycles and in sharing that knowledge being with your elders, being with your youth, and tying those life ways together through the single act of fishing. And so it goes so much further than you're catching a fish. It's about how are you preserving and protecting your culture, your life ways embodied within the treaty, right? You'll see here on the screen, these are some of the oldest photos we have um, that demonstrate some of the treaty fishing. And if we go to the next slide, You'll see some more photos here of how that fishing has uh, started to become more modernized. These photos being taken in the 1950s and the 1960s and the 1970s respectively. Next slide. 
the first case that Bay Mills Indian community became involved in in order to reaffirm our treaty rights was actually the case of People v. LeBlanc. Uh, Albert Big Abe LeBlanc, uh, who is my grandfather, actually went out on Pendles Bay here in Lake Superior on September 28, 1971, and set a gill net and um, had challenged the Michigan Department of Natural Resources at that time to come and arrest him because he was exercising his treaty right to fish, uh, which was in dispute with the state of Michigan. After being arrested, being ticketed, being fined, you know, being detained, uh, Bay Mills Indian community was able to support my grandfather in reaffirming that the treaty right to fish, hunt, and gather throughout the treaty ceded territory continued to exist and should be protected and honored uh, on the basis of those treaty negotiations. Next slide. I share these photos here, uh, which includes uh, Baco Tipple and a few of the parishes from Bay Mills Indian community to emphasize how contentious relationships were at the time and how far tribal citizens were willing to go in order to protect that treaty right. You'll see demonstrated here on the screen uh, images of folks fishing with guns. And it was not meant to be uh, an aggressive form of fishing, but rather was meant to protect themselves because they knew that they were being harassed and threatened either by state law enforcement officers or by other members of the public, but they needed that treaty right to be able to support their families, to engage in economy, and then most of all, to continue to practice their cultural life ways. And so these photos are a good capture and image of what that actually looked like for our tribal members who were out on the water. Next slide. After People v. LeBlanc went all the way up to the Michigan Supreme Court and was reaffirmed that there were existing treaty rights within the state of Michigan under the 1836 Treaty of Washington, the United States intervened in United States v. Michigan, uh, suing the state of Michigan under the 1836 Treaty of Washington to then federally reaffirm that their treaty rights continue to exist. What the court found in that litigation was that the provision of the 1836 treaty with the Ottawa and Chippewa and their successor tribes in Michigan stipulated for the right of hunting on the land seated with the other usual privileges of occupancy. Those other usual privileges of occupancy then included the broad treaty right within the treaty ceded territory to fish, hunt, and gather. It's extremely important to also identify that that court case found that there was not only the subsistence right for treaty rights, which typically includes taking something so that you can have food on your table, but that there was also a commercial right in that treaty right, and that our ancestors negotiated that commercial treaty right in order to also continue to provide for the livelihoods of those descendants and those next seven generations. We also have an image of the original ticket uh, from September 28th, uh, which is shown on this slide. Next slide, please. Um, as I've mentioned in this discussion, you know, a lot of the treaty right is also centered around indigenous lifeways and cultural resources. And what that means for the Anishinaabe here in the state of Michigan is actually tied to our creation story in the Straits of Mackinac. What that creation story details, just as with many creation stories across the world, is that the world, North America, was created during a time of a flood. And that when there was a flood and when North America was created, that land, that land mass was birthed here in the Straits of Mackinac. The way our cultural story, our creation story is told is that during the time of the great flood, uh, Nana Bojo, the creator, or Sky Woman, were resting on a turtle's back, seeking refuge from the flood. As Sky Woman resided on the turtle's back, Nana Bojo had asked Sky Woman to gather some soil from the bottom of the water in order to help him create North America or Turtle Island. Sky Woman, having animals residing on the turtle's back with her, had asked a variety of them to help her pick the soil up from the bottom of the water and many different animals tried and they failed. And it was actually the muskrat, the weakest of those animals that dove down and sacrificed his life in order to bring that soil up so that the North American content could be created. 
sky woman taking that soil from the muskrat rubbed it on the turtle's back then creating what we now know as north america and i share these images on here to show the depiction of the turtle in the shape of north america and then to identify where the great lakes are on that turtle which is known as the heart of turtle island the heart of north america and thus the straits of mackinac are a sacred place a vital place to the continued existence of north america that is what our teachings and what our stories uh, tell us and why we are here to protect the straits of mackinac to protect the great lakes so that we are also ensuring the continued existence and survival of north america as a whole next slide please The treaty rights interwoven into our indigenous lifeways are just as important, not only because of the stories and the traditions that we share um, you know, with one another when we are in the act of exercising that treaty right, but also because it's how we continue to provide for ourselves. Our teachings tell us that we as men and women were created last not because we are the most important, but rather because we are the least important. And we rely on everything else in order to be able to continue to survive. And so when we hunt, when we fish, when we gather, we give an offering of SEMA or tobacco to give thanks for those resources because we know that they are providing us sustenance, that they are providing us our continued existence. Next slide, please. So what does this mean in terms of line five? What does this mean in terms of having um, a treaty right and how are you able to protect it when you're engaging in, in certain legal issues like this? What it boils down to is that when negotiating that treaty right, state and federal agencies have an active role in protecting tribal treaty rights and resources in a way that supersede and predate any of the rights that have been associated to Enbridge in the Line 5 uh, litigation. The United States Constitution, as mentioned previously, embodies treaties within its text, stating that treaties shall be the supreme law of the land, and that treaty rights are guaranteed not only against the United States, but also against the states, their agents, and their grantees. What that means then is that states like the state of Michigan, uh, state of Wisconsin, you know, the United States must guarantee that treaty rights remain available and meaningful to tribal nations. And that can include a variety of things such as guaranteeing tribal citizens have continued access to water and lands where they exercise those treaty rights. Or in this instance with line five that they're preserving those resources like fish populations, ecosystems and habitats upon which the treaty rights depend. If the treaty rights upon, if the resources that the treaty rights depend upon are destroyed, then the treaty right is violated. You'll see here I have cited a case called Washington v. United States that is also known as the Culverts case, which came out of the state of Washington and demonstrated that right to protect and preserve that obligation on the federal and the state governments as it's affirmatively honoring that treaty right. The culverts case really examined where state-owned culverts located under state roads obstructed fish passages. And in that situation, the court ruled that the state had violated its duty owed to those tribes under that treaty, thus guaranteeing those treaty rights. Next slide, please. That ultimately, those treaty rights, that indigenous way of life is why Bay Mills Indian community and other tribes are involved in the Line 5 fight. Just as our ancestors negotiated that treaty right in those treaty negotiations to continue to preserve an indigenous way of life, we now must step up to the mantle to stop Line 5 so that we are doing the same for those next seven generations. Next slide, please. This will be shared you know, with folks after the presentation, but this is some of the active work that Bay Mills Indian community is involved in, uh, which includes not only the dual pipeline work, the tunnel project, but also some of the cultural resource work that we're engaged in, in order to protect the sacredness that is the Straits of Mackinac. Next slide, please. Ultimately, this is what we're trying to protect. These people, 
our aunties, our uncles, our nieces, our nephews, our children, and how they are preserving their indigenous life ways even now. I wanted to end on this slide because I want people to see the multi-generations that exist within our community even now. Uh, from the young ones, you know, who are helping with the net, who are filleting fish, who are going out and fishing and learning those stories, learning those traditions, practicing those life ways. That's what it's always been about. And that's why it was protected in that treaty. And that's why we're going to protect it again now. So thank you so much. That ends um, my portion of this presentation regarding uh, Bay Mills Indian community. And I'll turn it back over to Liz. Thank you so much, Whitney. Great, very grateful for your presentation. I'd like to now turn things over to Zach Welker and provide um, his background. And Zach is our legal director at Flow, working to protect the Great Lakes groundwater and drinking water for all. Before joining Flow, Zach Welker spent more than a decade representing Indian tribes in the Pacific Northwest on water, fisheries, and other natural resource issues. He was an associate attorney at Kanji and Katzen PLLC from 2009 to 2012 and worked as a legal and policy advisor for the Kalispell Tribe of Indians from 2012 to 2021. And Zach began his legal career as a law clerk for the Honorable Proctor Hug Jr. with the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. He graduated from the University of Oregon Law School. Thanks, Zach. Thank you, Liz, and thanks to everyone for being here today. Um, I really appreciated President Gravel's comments, and one of the things that I just thought I'd say before I begin is it's a really um, tough, tough battle to go up against a well-financed um, corporation like Enbridge that has pretty much unlimited resources, and one of the things that gives me some hope in, in um feeling like we could prevail is that the tribes in the state of Michigan are aligned. And that's really rare in my experience working in Indian country and working with states. And um, I hope that we're able to marshal that momentum from that relationship to um, make some progress on this. But that being said, I now lost the screen. There it is. Okay. Um, I wanted to start by just saying that um, there's a lot of uh, issues to cover here, so I'm going to be sort of at the 50,000 foot elevation, um, but the legal battle for line five is occurring on two fronts simultaneously. The first um, is largely litigation uh, that is seeking to shut down the existing pipeline, and the second is administrative proceedings associated with Enbridge's proposed tunnel project. And today I'll be talking about four separate suits one by the Bad River Band against Enbridge, one by Attorney General Nessel versus Enbridge, one by Governor Whitmer versus Enbridge, and one that was filed by Enbridge against the state. And on the administrative side of things, we'll be discussing the um, request by Enbridge for state authorization to uh, construct and operate its pipelines. Um, we'll, we'll also be looking at a wetlands dispute um, involving the Bay Mills Indian community and Eagle and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers um, upcoming environmental impact statement process. Next slide, please. So we're going to start over in Wisconsin, um, where many of us in Michigan are not um, as intensely focused, but um, where there are significant developments that are really helpful in the in the battle to shut down line five. And so in 2019, um, the Bad River Band filed a suit in federal court to force Enbridge to remove a portion of line five from its reservation. And Enbridge claims uh, ongoing entitlement to occupy reservation lands under these easements that expired back in 2013. And um, the Bad River Band is, has, has filed numerous state and federal law accounts, including trespass to evict Enbridge. And there's been extensive discovery in this litigation, and I included one of the gems that emerged from discovery in which Enbridge's director of operation admits we are currently operating in trespass. And uh, 
In any event, um, the parties have filed cross motions for partial summary judgment and a decision is anticipated in late August. And if necessary, there is a trial scheduled for October. Um, so we're waiting to see what happens there um, with bated breath. Next slide, please. Shortly before Bad River filed its lawsuit, Attorney General Nessel filed a lawsuit in state court on behalf of the people of Michigan to protect public trust resources and uses. And um, again, going back to President Gravel's um, discussion previously, uh, this is a really encouraging development from state trustees under Michigan's public trust doctrine who aren't always aligned with the interest of the people and their resources and uses. And this is a really important um, development for the attorney general to take this action. And I, I really wanna underscore that although the public trust doctrine does protect resources like our water, that the issue is also about the uses that are associated with our public water. So navigation and fishing and, and things of that nature, swimming and drinking water. Um, and anyway, in this in this suit, um, the attorney general is seeking a declaration from the court that the easement is void and revocable and uh, the issuance of a permanent injunction for an orderly shutdown. Next slide, please. Enbridge responded to this um, complaint by filing a motion to dismiss. Um, and the crux of its motion to dismiss is that the Federal Pipeline Safety Act more or less occupies the, the field um, of safety regulation regarding pipelines. And Enbridge has characterized the state's action here as um, essentially being a safety regulation, um, which again is inconsistent with what I said previously about the public trust doctrine protect, protecting uses. Um, and we're not, and it's not just about a leak of, of a pipeline into the water. Um, it includes that as well. Uh, so the state, the state said, well, wait a minute, and um, filed a motion for summary disposition and said, you know, we don't even have to get to, to the issue of federal preemption. The 1953 easement um, that the Conservation Commission issued to Enbridge's predecessor was void from its inception because under longstanding public trust law, the commission failed to make the required public trust findings to make an authorized or to effectively legally warrant um, Enbridge's predecessor to occupy state-owned bottomlands. Um, the parties engaged in extensive briefing and oral argument on these issues, um, but the, the um, case was ultimately held in abeyance following the governor's um, filing of her 2020 lawsuit. Next slide, please. So the governor's suit is a little bit different from the AG's in that um, the governor and the Department of Natural Resources issued a notice of revocation and termination in which they found that the 1953 easement was revocable and terminable. And so instead of asking the court for a declaration that um, it to determine on its own that the easement was void from its inception, it's asking the court to uphold the state's determination that it's void from the inception as well as terminable. Um, but other than that, the the governor, like the AG, was seeking an orderly shutdown of the pipelines. Next slide, please. So Enbridge responded to this lawsuit much differently than it did the Attorney General's lawsuit, um, whereas it raised these federal preemption claims and tried to battle it out in state court um, in response to the AG's suit. It didn't like what it saw from maybe the state court judge and decided to remove the case to federal court. And it did that by repackaging its federal preemption defenses as sort of novel ways to obtain federal court jurisdiction. And the state filed a motion to remand, um, highlighting the weaknesses in Enbridge's arguments, but the federal court ultimately sided with Enbridge. And this, this created kind of a conundrum for the state because under federal procedural law, there's no opportunity to immediately appeal uh, uh, remand order um, or denial of remand. And so um, the state had to choose between going to, to litigate the merits in federal court and then eventually um, appealing the, the, the judge's determination or 
dismissing the case and um, basically reopening the 2019 case that was currently held in abeyance. And the state opted for the latter approach um, by voluntarily dismissing the case, which means that um, it, it's a dismissal without prejudice, which means that the state can bring that case again if it so desires. And it also has the effect of um, nullifying all of the proceedings that um, preceded the, the voluntary dismissal. Next slide, please. So before we can get into how Enbridge responded to that, I just wanted to point out that at the time that Enbridge removed uh, Governor Whitmer's case, it also filed its own lawsuit against the state and federal court, um, arguing that federal law preempts the state shutdown. And Enbridge filed a motion for summary judgment. The state filed a motion to dismiss on sovereign immunity grounds. And um, lots of amicus briefs were filed in support of both parties. Uh, briefing was completed in April of 2022, and we're still waiting for a decision from Judge Neff on that. Next slide, please. So I wish that the return of the AG were um, quite this dramatic, but unfortunately it wasn't. Um, before uh, the case could be taken out of abeyance, Enbridge decided to try to remove that to federal court as well. And the state filed a motion to remand, arguing under the federal removal statute that Enbridge was far too late in trying to remove this case to federal court. And um, the law is definitely on the state side on this, um, and it's articulated very clearly in the, in the party's briefing. Um, however, unfortunately, um, although the briefing was completed in February of 2022, we're still waiting on a decision um, from Judge Neff on this one too. Next slide, please. Okay, we're gonna shift the conversation now to the administrative proceedings. And the primary fight thus far has been in the MPSC contested case. And again, the MPSC is the Michigan Public Service Commission. And um, here, Enbridge is seeking authority under Act 16 to construct and operate its tunnel project. Next slide, please. There are a number of disputed issues here. And the threshold one is um, that Enbridge is requesting authorization to construct and operate when it has not yet obtained um, authorization to occupy the state bottomlands. And Flo, as an intervener in this matter, has really tried to hammer on this point that it would be premature for the MPSC to issue a decision um, authorizing the construction and operation without this authorization to occupy the land. Um, and so that's one of the the battles that, that's ongoing there. Um, another area of dispute are the Act 16 elements in which Enbridge needs to show that there's a public need for the project, that the route is reasonable, and that the proposed tunnel project would meet or exceed safety and engineering standards. And then the third uh, major front involves the Michigan Environmental Protection Act. And um, basically here, if if the proposed tunnel project is likely to impair the environment, then the burden shifts to Enbridge to show that there's no feasible and prudent alternative. And the goal here is to really force Enbridge to consider using existing capacity to meet the demand. Um, and there's good reason to think that that's possible based on what Liz dis discussed at the outset of this. So there's been a substantial amount of testimony, cross-examination and briefing on these issues. And that was completed in March of 2022. Next slide. Um, and on July 7th, we got an order from the MPSC. And the order basically remanded uh, the proceedings back to the ALJ for more info on the routing considerations of the pipeline and the safety and engineering considerations. And you know, this is good insofar as it indicates that the MPSC is taking a serious look at the routing and the safety and engineering concerns, but um, it's, it's not so good in that it suggests that the MPSC is going to look at the risk of the proposed tunnel project relative to the risk of the existing pipeline instead of relative to the risk of there not being a pipeline to begin with. So it makes it, could potentially make it a little bit easier for um, Enbridge to diminish its impacts or for the, the MPSC to conclude that the impacts aren't quite as great as they will be. Uh, the decision was also a little disheartening because uh, the MPSC 
didn't issue any comment on the authorization issue to occupy the state bottom lands, um, nothing on MEPA. And it also seemed to assume that um, by not asking for any more information on public need that, that likely Enbridge has made that demonstration. I could be wrong on that, but that's just reading the tea leaves. Um, so the ALJ has issued a scheduling order for the collection and receipt of this evidence, and it's going to culminate in a hearing in April of 2023. Um, so this won't be decided for a long time. Next slide, please. Really briefly, um, the this dispute between Bay Mills Indian Community and Eagle concerns the issuance of a wetlands permit. Um, the ALJ dismissed the case due to untimeliness concerns. Um, earlier this month, the Environmental Permit Review Commission sided with Bay Mills and remanded the case for consideration on the merits. And the critical issues there are, is the wetlands permit in the public interest? And that requires a close look at cultural and historical resources and um, making sure that Eagle complied with tribal consultation and public participation requirements. Next slide, please. Um, the, the last sort of front is an emerging one. Uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has to issue permits to authorize the pipeline and has determined that it needs to conduct a full environmental impact statement before it makes a decision on that. And this is a vast process um, that's likely to take a couple of years at a minimum. Um, scoping hasn't begun, but um, you know, the, the cumulative impacts of this decision are immense. And so this is likely to take a lot of time and it'll be critical that those of you that are concerned about um, the tunnel project, uh, make your voices heard through this process. And that's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zach. Super helpful to lay out both the legal and administrative fronts here. It is my pleasure to bring Sean McBrarity on as our next speaker. Um, Sean is campaign coordinator for the Oil and Water Don't Mix campaign and the legislative and policy director at Michigan Clean Water Action, where he works on water infrastructure, oil and gas, and drinking water issues. Sean has served as a leader in the campaign to decommission Enbridge's Line 5 pipeline for the past six years. He learned the importance of protecting drinking water and our environment from a young age growing up in a community devastated by perennial droughts and poor water and air quality in California's Central Valley. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, thanks for having me, Liz. Um, and thanks for joining today, everybody. Um, so uh, I'm gonna get right to it. Um, today, I wanted to talk really about the updates. We've had such great updates from uh, Whitney and from Zach about the um, all the great work that Bay Mills Indian community has been leading on on line, fi on line five, as well as um, all the current legal and administrative advocacy going on. Um, and at the same time as all that is happening, those of you uh, who live in Michigan, uh, I'm sure um, are aware that Enbridge is spending a lot of money on advertising. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So in 2021, uh, the Oil and Water Don't Mix campaign, uh, along with our partners, uh, decided to track the spending that we could uh, on Enbridge's advertising in Michigan. Um, and you know, for context, a lot of the things that Enbridge is trying to do, uh, both through regulatory processes and in court, are really efforts to stall. Um, the longer they can stall the inevitable fate of Line 5 uh, to shut down the longer they can you know, make profits pumping oil through this outdated and dangerous pipeline. Uh, so that's really what their goal here is. Um, and so in order to do that, especially with Governor Whitmer and Attorney General Nessel uh, coming after them, Enbridge has really been working to sow doubt in the Michigan public with a massive disinformation campaign. Um, just in the money we could track, uh, in 2021, they spent over $8 million on TV and digital advertising in Michigan. So that's not counting their billboards, that's not counting their um, expenditures in Washington DC and in other markets uh, where they're spending. It's also not counting their lobbying expenses, which uh, you know, unfortunately due to Michigan's lax campaign finance laws are very difficult to track. Um, 
so these ads, I'm sure most of you have seen them, really push a narrative that even Enbridge knows is false. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, a few uh, a few weeks ago, thanks to uh, some documents that were <clears throat> released publicly as part of the Bad River Band case uh, that Zach did a quick overview of in Wisconsin, um, we you know found out that uh, an Enbridge document that was formerly confidential was released publicly, and in that doc, uh, an Enbridge expert uh, actually confirms what we've said for years and what the independent studies have shown for years that shutting down line five would not have um, a huge impact on gas prices or on gas supply uh, in the Midwest, uh, you know, in Michigan and Wisconsin specifically, or even in Canada. Um, according to Enbridge's own expert, shutting down line five would raise gas prices in Michigan uh, by around half a cent a gallon. Um, and might raise gas prices in Ontario by as much as one to two cents per liter. Um, and again, because of extra supply capacity within the pipeline system, uh, this could be done in very short order with no supply disruption either. Uh, therefore, the arguments um, <clears throat> that have been made by Enbridge and their allies about refineries having to shut down are not based at all in fact. Um, so, Again, this pushing, uh, pushing doubt and making it sound like there's going to be an energy apocalypse without this one pipeline is a way that Enbridge is working to stall uh, the shutdown of Line 5 so that they can keep pumping oil through this pipeline for as long as possible. Um, another big reason that they're fighting right now is you know, when we win and shut down Line 5 without replacement, this will be the first time that an existing pipeline um, that's been running for years is shut down for environmental concerns before it ruptures. Um, and that's something that the oil industry as a whole is very afraid of because when the first domino falls, uh, the rest of their shoddy and outdated infrastructure could be, um, uh, could be on its way out as well. Um, move to the next slide, please. Uh, so this being an election year, there's obviously a lot of political implications um, with the future of Line 5. Uh, it's already been an issue uh, in several of the campaigns so far. All of the Republican Party candidates for attorney general and for governor, uh, so the five governor candidates uh, who will be duking it out until the primary next Tuesday, and uh, the attorney general candidate Matt DiPerno, uh, have all already committed to dropping any ongoing attempts to force the shutdown of Line 5. Most of them have also said that they would use the power of government to try to hasten the process of building an oil tunnel under the Great Lakes. Um, so this is, uh, you know, they're basically riding the back of Enbridge's advertising um, and Enbridge's disinformation campaign to try to score political points um, even when we know the facts really don't line up here, line five has no benefit to Michigan. Um, then, you know, already in this election cycle, we're starting to see vast amounts of dark money uh, from the oil industry and their allies um, being spent to influence the 2022 election. Uh, if you're sitting in Enbridge's position right now, the best chance <clears throat> they have to win on line five in a timely manner uh, is to see a Republican governor and attorney general in Michigan and make sure that Governor Whitmer and Attorney General Nessel don't win. Uh, so that's exactly what they're going to be trying to do. Um, the, uh, you know, the, unfortunately, again, part of the issue with our political laws in Michigan and in the United States more widely is uh, we, we call it dark money because it's next to impossible to track. Um, we've caught Enbridge uh, making some questionable political donations in the past, uh, but the vast majority of what they're doing uh, is through super PACs uh, where we can't actually track where the spending is going and who's spending the money directly. Um, but uh, so they, you know, they've already been paying attention to this election. We've already seen through uh, so many of the Republican candidates running out here um, that you know, these candidates are going to stick to the message that we need line five, even when all the facts uh, counter that, um, because they're going to get oil industry money in order to keep saying that. 
Um, federal efforts are also ongoing here from the oil industry and Canada. Um, I think Zach touched on briefly the um, 1977 Transit Pipeline Treaty, uh, which, um, you know, a little background on that piece, it was signed in 1977. Uh, kind of the height of the 1970s oil crisis. And the crux of the treaty is that neither Canada or the US is gonna cut off the other party from oil. Um, however, Canada is taking this overly broad reading of the treaty. And this treaty, by the way, has never been invoked. So there's not a precedent as to how it ought to be understood. Um, so Canada is taking this broad understanding of the treaty and trying to say that you would actually need the full approval of both federal governments to shut down any hydrocarbon infrastructure that, class, that crosses the border, um, which is absolutely ridiculous, especially considering the fourth article of the treaty is all about how uh, relevant governmental authorities like states and provinces uh, are able to regulate the transport of hydrocarbons in order to protect the environment. Um, and that's really what the state is working to do here uh, they're not saying to Canada that you can't move hydrocarbons across the border and through Michigan. They're saying you can't do it through this ancient, dangerous pipeline. Um, next slide, please. So on the oil tunnel as well, this is another place where Enbridge um, you know, really enjoys making arguments that are not based in fact. Um, so one of the first things that Enbridge had to do in researching building uh, their oil tunnel um, was to do a detailed geotechnical study of the geology in the Straits of Mackinac. Um, and the reason for that is pretty simple. Uh, when you're tunneling through somewhere, you need to know what exactly you're going to be drilling through, especially considering that the Straits of Mackinac is notoriously complicated geology. Um, and, comp and complex geology, uh, like what's found in the Straits, can often lead to problems uh, during tunneling. So. Enbridge's geotech study, first of all, they did about one tenth of the industry recommended research uh, for a project in geology that's this complex. Um, second, out of the small amount of research they did do, uh, they found that most of the rock samples they took uh, had a similar porosity to sand, not bedrock. Uh, so a lot of water would be inflowing into the tunnel while it's being constructed. Um, second, they found areas with methane detected in groundwater above trace amounts, which can be a sign uh, that there would be there might be methane pockets they run into while drilling, which can cause uh, large explosions during the drilling process itself. Um, and there's you know, tons more issues with the soil tunnel, including the fact that they're going to use a tunnel boring machine um, in here. That's their, their plans to use this tunnel boring machine. Tunnel boring machines often get stuck when they're tunneling. And the common procedure is to drill another hole from the surface, take the machine out, fix it, and then put it back in. You can't very well do that in the Straits of Mackinac, so it's actually not clear what they would do if a tunnel boring machine dies in this process. Um, so as Zach said, the permitting here is likely to take two to three more years minimum. Enbridge has asked uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to depreciate the entire lakehead system over 20 years, mainly due to climate policy changes. Um, now, what that means is they've asked their federal regulator to depreciate the, the value of their entire pipeline system that Line 5 is a part of uh, to zero dollars by about 2040. Um, the approximate reason they're doing that is because that way they can raise tariffs and make more money off the oil they're transporting. Um, but that really stands in stark contrast to their uh, you know, promise to these Michigan politicians saying that uh, they would operate an oil tunnel for 99 years. Um, by the time permitting is done two to three years from now, uh, and then charitably another six, seven years to build an oil tunnel, we're looking at, uh, you know, 2030 at the very earliest before this would be in operation. And what, they're going to run it for 10 years and then their system is going to be valueless. Um, it, the tunnel just doesn't make any sense. It is, again, a stalling tactic here. Um, Enbridge experts, again, just to include, have also proved uh, and have now agreed with the rest of the independent studies that have been done that there is no need for a Line 5 oil tunnel because there is simply no need for Line 5. Um, so I know folks have heard a lot today about 
what um, you know where the problem is right now, and the great legal experts um, and tribal advocates who are working uh, to working to win in this fight. Um, and there's other ways. We need as many people as as can and as are interested to get involved. Please go to the next slide. We're going to talk about ways uh, where folks can get involved while we continue this fight. Um, so first thing that uh, you know, we'd like to have people do, if you go to oilandwaterdontmix.org, you can sign our petition to President Biden asking him to take action on line five. Uh, there's a lot that the president can do. Right now is especially crucial because um, since uh, Senator Joe Manchin has held up climate talks um, in Congress, uh, Manchin, or I'm sorry, Biden is now looking at executive actions that he can take uh, to address the climate crisis. And a great executive action would be to revoke the presidential permit for line five, since they are operating illegally in Michigan. Um, it would be a great way of forcing them to comply with Governor Whitmer's lawful order to shut down uh, after she revoked their easement. Um, so signing the petition to President Biden is great. Uh, number two, really get on Flo's email list, get on Oil and Water's email list, all of our partner organizations, um, make sure that uh, you're staying involved and engaged in this process. The permitting process is a long and confusing fight, uh, but having people involved really does matter. It really makes an impression on groups like the Army Corps or the, or the Michigan Public Service Commission when they're hearing from thousands and thousands of concerned residents about a project. Um, so stay engaged. Uh, part of the reason why the industry often wins these fights is because they have the money to stay engaged the whole time and people tend to lose interest. So, you know, this is a fight that we're going to need everybody's help to win. Please continue to stay engaged. Um, and last, I'd just like to put a plug in for uh, two of the volunteer programs uh, that we're currently uh, working on through the Oil and Water Don't Mix team. Um, we have a team, I'm sure, again, folks have seen the Enbridge advertisements. We're never going to meet, meet them dollar for dollar. We don't need to meet them dollar for dollar to win. We need people power. Um, so what we're doing is we have one team that is learning about how to write letters to the editor and how to get them submitted in a way that's going to get them published. Um, and that team is meeting on a fairly regular basis and asking folks to write into their local papers about line five, especially when they see an article like we often see in the Detroit news, for example, spouting misinformation about line five. Um, and uh, then the other team that we have, which is a, a very important uh, opportunity that we have right now is we have a grassroots candidate education team. Um, and we actually have the next meeting for that one scheduled for next Wednesday, August 3rd at seven o'clock at night. Um, please join us. What you, learn on, what you learn how to do on that team is how to find uh, the people who are running for office in your neck of the woods um, and best practices for finding where they're going to be and going to have conversations with them um, about line five and why it's an important issue to, to you and why it should be important to them. The oil industry and the groups opposing us have tons and tons of paid lobbyists walking up and down the halls in DC doing this on a daily basis. Um, the way that we can meet that is with people power and I really need folks to sign up to help with our candidate education and letter to the editor pro programs uh, to make sure that the voices of Michigan residents who care about protecting our Great Lakes and shutting down this pipeline can continue to be heard in the process. Um, and yeah, next slide, please. I think that's uh, all I have. If anyone has any questions, please reach out anytime. Those are on my Twitter, hand, Twitter handles, Oil and Waters website, and my email. Uh, thanks very much for having me. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for giving such a powerful plug on how people can get engaged. And, and I want to just pick up on that theme. And if you could just turn your screens on. Sean and Zach and Whitney, that would be wonderful. And um, now we we get to enter uh, the portion of, of the program where we uh, are engaging um, terrific questions from our audience. And um, one one of the one of the questions we have is, um, uh, and I'm staying on the how to be stay engaged on line five is um, Sean, maybe you could speak a little bit about um, what we're anticipating with the EIS process and 
um, and how the public can get engaged on that. And then, you know, I would invite, you know, President Gravel and Zach, of course, to weigh in as well. Yeah, thank you. So engagement on the EIS process is going to be really critical as it gets up and running here. And, um, you know, without the EIS being underway, there's not, there's not an action that I can uh, send people to right now, unfortunately. But if you're on Flo's mailing list and you get on Oil and Water Don't Mix's uh, email list as well, you'll, you'll be sure to get the notifications as soon as we're ready. And we're going to be asking people um, at several points through the environmental impact statement process to be making public comments. I would just add as well, you know, it's really beneficial from a, a government standpoint to have help from the public to be able to attend these events in person. Uh, oftentimes they're in Lansing or, you know, with the Army Corps, they're going to be in Detroit. And we make as much and as many efforts as we can to attend those things, but sometimes there's short notice. You know, most recently with the Michigan Public Service Commission, we had about 24 hour notice uh, before they were having a public hearing. And that's just not enough time for us to uh, move the things we need to do to be there in attendance. But really, sometimes the most powerful comments come from members of the public. And um, I don't know their names, you know, but to give a shout out, there's a, a young mom and her son who attend every single one of those hearings and I'll get to watch them from my office and her words and his words together are so powerful because you're seeing that work being carried by the next generation, her son, who loves the Great Lakes just as much as we do. And so if you're nearby or available online comments, you know, being present in person, that's really how we create those relationships one and with one another and can establish the connections we need to share our stories and why we want Line 5 shut down. I uh, love, love those comments and, and that, you know, is really, really true. I mean, it's the voices of our, our collective voices that are, are really shifting this, this conversation. Um, boy, lots of questions. Um, <laughs> uh, there, there's a um, question about how prepared the Coast Guard, uh, the EPA, Eagle, uh, core are in the event of a spill um, in the Straits of Mackinac. And I would just add that we recently experienced um, a spill up in the Sioux, up near Bay Mills Indian community. And um, President Gravel, maybe you could, you could share um, your experience uh, with that spell, excuse me, with that spill to kind of telegraph the, the enormous challenges that agencies face, uh, breakdowns of communication and, and so forth. Yeah, thanks Liz. And that's what I thought of immediately, you know, on, on how do we respond to spills? I think when you ask, you know, how prepared are they? It's how do we define prepared? You know, do they have policies and procedures in place? Yes, but how are they engaging in the lines of communication or action in order to make sure that a spill is addressed uh, most immediately. Um, what we experienced with the St. Mary's River is that Algoma Steel, which is located on the uh, Canadian side of the St. Mary's River, had a uh, mechanical oil spill into the river that was not detected for several hours. Um, it's estimated that it begun in the early hours of the morning. We did not receive our first notification or first our, or were made aware of the spill until around one or two o'clock in the afternoon. You know, immediately then booms were deployed, you know, crews were out, they were monitoring if the oil was uh, touching other surfaces, either on Sugar Island or here on the St. Mary's River, monitoring the weather conditions. But at that point, it had actually traversed uh, quite an expansive area um, before it could be fully addressed. Did they do what they needed to do in order to respond? Yes. Was it the most effective response that could exist? No. And you know, one of the lingering frustrations that we have is um, due to the nature of the uh, substance that was spilled, um, most of the way it was remedied was that it was going to naturally dissipate. And so they left it alone. They said, you know, it will uh, degrade over a week or two time. We will continue to watch for oil sheens and we will just wait for it to naturally um, disappear from the surface water. Uh, what was equally frustrating then is we had also received notification from NOAA 
uh, regarding the substances. And there is a report that states there could be long-term aquatic uh, impacts. And, uh, but we don't know what those are, right? How long was it there? What impacts did it have? Uh, we issued advisories, you know, to stay out of the water uh, for several weeks until that did dissipate. And there's still a question remaining of, you know, should you be consuming fish then uh, from that area? And that's something we're still trying to figure out. That was one small spill. You know, they estimate that it was roughly uh, 2,300 to 5,000 gallons of mechanical oil. That's nothing that would be compared to what happens to line five, whether in the water or on land, um, especially given that the dual pipelines sit at the bottom of the water in the Straits of Mackinac. If there was an oil spill to occur there, for us to even have the detection on a surface level, like with the St. Mary's River, it has to travel through all of that water before we even detect it. Um, we have raised questions to the Coast Guard and the EPA too regarding response uh, when the Straits are covered with ice, because that is a reality that we deal with here in Northern Michigan. And we have not received a response that we're satisfied with on you know, how we would re uh, remediate any type of oil spill that occurs uh, below any type of ice coverage. So um, unfortunately, I guess I don't have an answer. It depends on how much you're willing to you know, trust the mechanisms that are in place, but improvements could certainly be made. No, I, well, I, I think President Gravelli provided a very uh, illustrative picture of, of how complex, uh, you know, a, a spill could be for ecosystems, drinking water, um, and, you know, the shutdown of uh, an economy um, that, that depends on, on line five. Um, I, so thank you for that. I want to turn it. I'm looking at more questions coming in from folks. Um, Zach, I wanted to direct a question to you. Um, and this is one where you have to speculate. Um, uh, but what, um, what do you make of the absence of climate and greenhouse gas considerations in the, the recent um, MPSC order? And, um, and the comment, the Questioner is asked, you know, it's quite narrowly focused on the safety of the tunnel. Yeah, I think that's unfortunate. Um, and I mean, the the skeptic in me thinks that um, the commission has likely made up its mind on on some of the issues that we care very deeply about. You know, um, MEPA alternatives, um, how it's going to consider climate, things like that. Um, largely because it didn't ask for more information on, on those issues. And so the information that it's going to get is not, I don't think it's going to do much in terms of really evaluating the impacts of the proposed tunnel. It's more being able to more accurately describe the impacts of the existing pipeline. And if we're looking at the existing pipeline, that's not focused on, on the tunnel's impacts on climate. It's, it's focused on the tunnel's impacts on climate relative to the existing pipeline's impacts on climate. And I don't think that's the right question. So I'm a bit concerned by that. Thank you, Zach. Can we talk a little bit more about the alternatives? Um, Sean, maybe you could talk a little bit about kind of the, um, you know, the expansion of line 6B um, in Southern Michigan and uh, other options for um, shutting down line five. I think um, the the narrative has really been about the current pipe, the the current operations, and then Embridge's proposed solution, which is this tunnel. What are the other alternatives that are that are viable so people can have conversations with their lawmakers to to um, really uh, debunk the this narrative that Embridge keeps on putting forward. Yeah, well, thank you. I think, you know, the first of all, I would not recommend getting into a super detailed discussion with lawmakers about this unless you are confident that you have all the facts down. Um, but the important parts to get across if you're having a conversation with a lawmaker or a candidate about this um, are that Enbridge's own studies agree with the studies that have been done by independent experts that there will not be supply disruptions or, or major price fluctuations due to a line five shutdown. 
Um, some of the specifics here. So when line 6B spilled into the Kalamazoo River 12 years ago, uh, the line was rebuilt and its capacity was doubled from 400,000 barrels a day to 800,000 barrels a day. Um, that is more than enough capacity uh, when you combine line 6B with some other very discrete delivery options, uh, such as for the propane use in the Upper Peninsula, trucking that from Rapid River and bringing it from the Eastern UP, which would be roughly one to three uh, trucks a day or one train car a week. Um, th so the, using the expanded capacity of 6B along with other available pipeline routes um, can feed the refineries that currently get oil from line five. Um, and you know, another important thing to consider in this is while the whole line five saga has been going on in Michigan in 2015, um, there was actually an oil glut in Sarnia where line five ends. Uh, and there was too much oil in Sarnia for the refineries there to be able to process it. So they reversed line nine, which used to run from Montreal to Sarnia. And now it runs from Sarnia to Montreal and feeds the Montreal refineries, which were previously fed by uh, ocean going boats. Um, it feeds the Montreal refineries through line nine. So some of, some of the oil from line five, we don't know how much, uh, is getting through to the Montreal refineries via line nine. Um, so, you know, the details here all get very confusing. If you point them to, there's a lot of good information on Flo's website. There's also a page uh, on Oil and Water's website where we link to the study done by Enbridge's expert and also the rebuttal studies um, that are there. So if you wanna read a few hundred pages about it, there's a lot more to look into. Um, and then on top of that, really though, um, you know, we're at a time with the climate crisis where we need to start moving away from oil. Um, so not only do we not need to be building new infrastructure, we need to be cutting down the amount of oil that we're using. Um, so it shouldn't be on regular people out there across the state and across the country to figure out how Enbridge is going to continue to make a dime off of us. Um, our job should be to hasten the tradition to green energy. And one of the best ways to do that is by shutting down infrastructure like Line 5, which is unnecessary and a threat to the future of our planet. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sean. And, and, you know, with the breaking development of, of Mansion now supporting uh, climate change bill, I think, you know, there's, there's more to dig in to figure out how uh, that legislation could potentially um, I, I dovetail with this. Go ahead. Yeah, I wouldn't call it a climate change bill. Um, the Hill and some other outlets have been irresponsibly reporting this as a climate change bill. Mm -hmm. uh, what it is is an above all energy plan bill. And what Manchin has said, um, you know, and Manchin owns a coal company. Um, I hope most people are aware of that. That's how Manchin got his money. And he's been a shill for the coal industry throughout his career, uh, both in Washington and formerly as the governor of West Virginia. Um, what Manchin's bill, what Manchin's agreement on climate would do is say, okay, federal government, you look the other way on pipeline permitting, and we'll let you have some money for wind and solar. Um, the, uh, a lot of the things that are in there are basically cutting the federal government's legs off when it comes to regulating pipeline projects and other new fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, and Manchin is trying to claim this is a great climate deal because there's also some money in there for renewables and electric vehicles. Um, but really, I mean, senators who actually care about climate change should reject this deal. Manchin's given in halfway here, uh, but there's no reason for us to accept that uh, and to accept easier permitting for the fossil fuel industry in exchange for a few dollars for renewables. Okay. Hey, Liz, well, along, along the line of questioning that, that you were just asking, I think one of the things that's really important to, to keep in mind with regard to Enbridge's um, claimed economic impacts is that if Enbridge really had evidence of these excessive economic impacts on regular people, a court will factor that evidence into the remedy for an orderly shutdown. Um, and so, you know, I think Enbridge, first of all, doesn't have that evidence. It hasn't, it hasn't provided it. I haven't seen it yet. Um, and secondly, if it did, then there will be a mechanism for the courts to address that. And, and so it's just getting people excited about something that's functionally not real. Well, we unfortunately are getting to the 
top of our hour, uh, President Grill, is there any last things you'd like to just comment on? I know there are lots of interest of the engagement and leadership from the tribes uh, in this process. I think it's extremely important that we continue to stay engaged. I often describe the line five process as three-dimensional chess, sometimes seven-dimensional chess. You know, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of nuances. There's a lot of factual information. But I truly believe that if we stay united in our purpose of why we're involved in this fight, you know, which is really about protecting the Great Lakes, protecting water, uh, protecting um, life ways, that that message will continue to ring true no matter who you speak with. You know, when I bring anyone to the Great Lakes and we're standing on the shore of Lake Superior or Lake Michigan and Lake Huron to be surrounded by the beauty and the power that exist in these places is more than enough to remind people of why we also need to respect these things and protect them. And so as we move forward in all of this, you know, facts are gonna change, bills are gonna change, representatives are gonna change, policy and law will change as decisions are made, but we have to stay true to why we're all in this. You know, it's, it's not about us, it's about protecting the Great Lakes and it's about protecting those lightweights for those next seven generations. Well said, thank you for those wise words. And um, I wanna just uh, conclude by first off, thanking all of you for attending, for your continued passion and interest in this issue. We are all united by the Great Lakes. Um, I wanna thank all of you panelists, President Gravel, Sean and Zach for your uh, incredible insights and knowledge and, um, and inspiration to keep, keep uh, staying true uh, and, and um, united in our collective work together. I'd like to express a um, special thank you for the grant support from the Mackinac Island Community Foundation. We're going to be following up uh, with a link to the uh, recording and um, other links and resources that we've shared. Uh, we will be following up with more of the questions and um, and I, I thought just as a closing thought, I wanted to really echo what President Gravel and, and others have said today. And it is because of you and your collective voices uh, that we have moved the needle on line five. We have brought this sunken hazard out of obscurity under the rule of law and into the national and international spotlight. And our work, of course, however, is not yet done, and it will require all of us to continue to stand in the state of Michigan in protecting our public trust rights. So thank you, stay engaged, and um, uh, thank you for taking action to protect the Great Lakes. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Liz.